Welcome back ladies and gentlemen to the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind. My name is Camel and today we're going to be taking a look at the 10 most hidden unique items in Morrowind. Now by most hidden I mean items that most players would likely never find during a normal playthrough and would never know they existed without watching a video like this or reading about it online somewhere. Now Morrowind was and still is the most transformative game that I have ever played, introducing me to RPGs and a completely alien and adult realm of the fantasy genre. Carrying that theme on, Morrowind has actual secrets tucked away for one in thousands to find, making later titles look laughable, and I would love to share some of those secrets with you today. If you've never had the chance to play the game, or even if you have played the game, you will undoubtedly learn something new and be impressed at the level of detail in Morrowind. And if you are into this kind of stuff, my other video links and social media links can be found down in the description. Be sure to check that out after this video. There are also more than 10 items on this list due to multiple items being found in the exact same place or in the exact same way. And all of the items on this list you will need to find all by yourself randomly and you will not be guided by information from NPCs or quest markers because they don't exist in Morrowind. They are also in no particular order apart from the last one, which is the most ridiculous item acquisition in any Elder Scrolls game. So let's start off with a favorite hidden item of mine. It's not my favorite item, but the way it's been tucked away for so few to discover sure gets my wabberjack full of magicka. Even finding the entrance to this place is a pain in the Teldani Tower. On a small atoll in the middle of the western sector of the Ascadian Isles region, to the northwest of Tel Branora and to the east of Balfell, we will find the Marvani Ancestral Tomb, the entrance peppered with native wildflowers and the sun slowly rising over Azira's coast to the east. This place doesn't seem all that mysterious. So in we go. There are only a few undead skulking through the cobwebbed halls of this Dunmary burial chamber, but apart from the cluttering of urns and random objects on altars, there doesn't seem to be much in here, but there must be, and there is. At what we presume to be the final chamber of the tomb is a trapped door with a lock level of 80, an obstacle that can only be bypassed by a security expert. After opening it, we aren't met by a final chamber at all, but instead a nine-tiered stairwell leading deep into the Mother Stone, the Earth Bones, the Marrow of Mundus. At the base of the final run, we are met by yet another trapped door with a lock level of 80, although this one leads us somewhere else, to a cavern known as Tuku Chapal. Once in here, we'll be met by a unique sight looking like something from an old fantasy movie. An epically scaled stone chamber with hissing magma vents comprised of twisting black natural stone. Tamed from floor to ceiling with earth structure clay texture in the motif of traditional Dunmary culture. A literal labyrinth of old to be solved by the brave adventurer. The floor is laced with a layer of water. Be wary though as this maze is patrolled by ancient skeletal guardians. At the center of this wash stone skein lies yet another locked door. This leads to the Tuku Chapal Sepulchre, the final chamber. The door is trapped and has a lock level of 90, but once we prick back the ancient pins and align the mechanism we can enter. And wow, oh wow, is this a sight to behold, looking like something from a Spielberg movie. This is what adventuring is all about. A narrow chasm filled with deep water and a high ceiling. The centerpiece is of course this literal wooden ship in the heart of Nern. It is quite breathtaking to discover, like something that only belongs in mythology. This is the burial location of legendary Olmgird the Adlaw, son of Harald Handfree, who was a first era king of Skyrim. Surrounded by many pillaged treasures and hordes of plunder that Olmgird managed to harvest through his years of raiding, rare alchemical ingredients like fire and frost salts, a dragon scale helmet, shield and cuirass, potions of great strength and value, urns filled with scrolls and magical items, chests overflowing with wealth and heirlooms. And of course, 
his unique axe, Stormstrike. The item that we didn't come here for, actually. But if not for this great treasure tucked in such a strange place, then why are we here? Well, the keen-eared adventurer in here might hear the faint song of the giant purple crystal we find rarely in Vardenfell. But this chamber has no purple crystals, a riddle it would seem once again to be solved by the clever adventurer. For this, we must look to the heavens and use my favorite mechanic from Morrowind, levitation, and float our way up to the gnarled volcanic ceiling of this narrow and forgotten chamber, where we will spot the arcane glow of the very crystals we could hear to find a sky-high occult alcove, hiding from even the most hidden of rooms like the Tuku Shapal Sepulchre. Up here, we can find a chest, a Daedric Warhammer, but more importantly, the unique helmet, the Daedric Face of God. Not to be confused with the non-unique, although rare, Daedric Faces of Inspiration and Daedric Faces of Terror, as this is much more special. The Daedric Face of God, hidden in the most ridiculous place in an already ridiculously unfindable cavern inside an already hard to find ancestral tomb in the middle of nowhere in the Ascadian Isles. This is the kind of content that makes the fire in my explorer's hearth rage with passion for discovery. But now we have it, let's talk about it. The Daedric Face of God, an ancient piece whose visage represents Vec, the V of Alm Sivi, the tribunal warrior poet god of the Dunma Vivek. Although I've personally never seen Vivek in such a mood as the one presented on the helmet. Needless to say, its appearance is completely unique despite not being classed as an artifact. Now this isn't only just unique, it's not just collectible, it's actually an amazing piece of armor too, and has the highest armor rating of any unenchanted helmet in the game. Its base armor rating is 80 with a maximum armor rating of 266, on par with artifacts such as the Mask of Clavicus Vile and only to be beaten by the helm of Oren Bearclaw. Even the other two Daedric faces of inspiration and terror have armor ratings of 65 and 75 respectively, not matching the strength of the Daedric face of God. And with it being unenchanted, you can of course enchant it with whatever you want. But yeah, there it is, the Daedric face of God. Hopefully, in the next Elder Scrolls game, we'll see the Daedric face of Todd. So this next one is very strange and likely the most unique item on this list or in any Elder Scrolls game for that matter. It's also very easy to acquire but laying your eyes upon it is stupendously rare. To get this item, all we need to do is finish the main quest line of the Blood Moon DLC. It sounds simple, but this was a proper DLC with, you know, a 20 hour main quest line. So it's not really something you punch out in the afternoon. But most people who get the Blood Moon DLC will finish it and have fun doing it, fulfilling prophecies, uncovering dark magics, exploring Solstheim, fighting werewolves, and rubbing shoulders with the Hercene. So once all that good stuff has been finished, um, what now? Well, what we'll need to do is make our way to the Skull Village. Here, we will need to enter the Great Hall of the Skull Village, where we can find some locals standing, bathing in the warmth of the fire, thawing out from the clawing cold winds outside. But there is one decoration in here that stands out, the centerpiece of the room, the stuffed cliff racer hanging from the ceiling. But if we stare at it for too long, we'll get a glimpse. Notice a glimmer, spy a gleam, sparkling enchanted in the mouth of the foul beast. This is an enchanted ring called the Blue Dev's Ring of Viewing, and will only appear after the Blood Moon DLC main questline has been complete. So, this is all well and good, but what is this thing? And why does it have such a strange name? What does it actually do? Well, once we pick it up, it will appear in our inventory as expected, 
but it's got no enchantment. However, we can equip it and something very strange will happen. A list of options will pop up, each labeled with a unique name referencing the different cutscenes that play throughout the Blood Moon DLC main questline at certain stages. As you may expect, clicking any of the options will play the relevant cutscene. You can do this as many times as you want and it will always stay in your inventory for you to use whenever you so wish. This is the kind of item that traditionally you would only be able to find with console commands or in a developer room still lingering in the deep dark guts of the game. But to have something like this actually in the game and obtainable is superbly unique and something we definitely do not see anymore. The name of the ring, the blue devs ring of viewing, comes from Mark Nelson, one of Morrowind's writers and quest designers. In short, he was one of Morrowind's developers. His username on the Elder Scrolls forum and on Twitter was Blue Dev, stemming from his passionate following of the Duke Blue Devils basketball team. Blue Devils, Blue Dev, and Mark Nelson was also a dev, Blue Dev. And remember that information because Mark Nelson will be making a return later on in this video. But for now, the Blue Dev's ring of viewing. Grab it, stick your finger in it, and have fun while doing it. Next, we'll need to head to the harrowing north of the Ashlands region of Morrowind's northwest, where ash storms and hazes of sulfur blur the air, shrouding our exploration with a wondrous sense of discovery and danger. On the grey shores to the north, there is a Daedric ruin known as Ashurn Abidashbi. From here, we'll need to head southwest, where in a depression, like me, slumped against some rocks is a dilapidated wooden door, the portal to a cave system known as Ibardad, a dungeon holding a hidden secret. Also, curiously, inside we can find these huge purple gems, which again, we find rarely throughout Morrowinds. But the ones here in Ibardad are unique in that they contain skulls with daggers wedged into the top of them. Strange. Anyway, a short way through, we'll come out into a larger open room where we can find a hostile Dunma archaeologist, Badama Andaris. She is accompanied by a few scamps. Then behind a wooden door, there is a room home to an Ultima sorceress and archeologist, Elante. She is also hostile and worth killing so we can plunder her bountiful booty. This is all well and good, but uh, where's the secrets? Well, back near the top of the dungeon before heading down to the two archeologists, there is a pile of rocks over to the left that we can actually jump over, gaining access to a secret area of the cave that leads down to water and Daedric ruins. Winding further and further through, we'll enter a large chamber becoming more dense with ruins and even darker and more powerful Daedra, namely a Daedroth at this point. If we plunge ourselves into the ebony waters, we can find a sump leading to unfamiliar and ancient depths of Ibardad. Eventually, as we begin to run out of breath, after twisting and winding through these submerged passageways, we'll spot a welcome sight, the mirrored surface of water, which we will pierce. We can now breathe and make our way up via this fallen Daedric Ruin pillar. Up here, there is a doorless doorway leading to an antechamber where two Dremora Lords stand, guarding an ancient Daedric door. Two enemies not to be taken lightly, once they have been defeated, we need to get through this door. It has a lock level of 70 and is trapped, requiring the abilities of a skilled thief to gain entry. Once we pry open the ancient vault, a room of wonders awaits. Guarded by the impending Golden Saint, one of the most powerful Daedra in the Elder Scrolls III Morrowind. Once we can manage to defeat this obstacle of oblivion. Where do we even begin with this room? It's lined with treasure chests, each containing stockpiles of loot, ancient Daedric weapons just lying around the room ripe for the picking. There are ancient Dunmeri urns packed to the brim with powerful scrolls, lines of ancient skulls, each cranally punctured with an ancient silver dagger, much like the skulls we saw inside the crystals earlier on in the cave. At the back of the room is a skeleton, believed to be that of Mordrin Hannon. Not much is known about him, 
apart from the fact that at his wake he had the drinks poisoned so his acolytes would perish and keep him company in the next life. Which is interesting as if we pick up any of the daggers from the skulls, a hostile ancestral ghost will be summoned. Anyway, Mordrin Hannon is surrounded by astonishing loot, Daedric shields, weapons, and even one of the few existing Daedric faces of inspiration. None of which is what we're here for. We must aim higher, and quite literally look higher, hanging high above the ceremonial burial Cromlech of Mordrin Hannon. Hanging right near the ceiling is the legendary artifact tower shield Eliodon's Ward. This is what we came here for. This is why we sought secret, plunged black water, slew Daedra and pillaged tomb. It's an item of Breton legend and is actually the best shield in the entire game. How it found its way into the tomb of a questionable Mordrin Hannon is unknown. Its base armor rating is 100, which makes its maximum armor rating 333, which again is the highest of any shield in the game. And there are only a few other items that actually match this rating, like two or three other items. So its worthiness is unquestionable. Now, much like its protective capabilities, the enchantment is also amazing. When cast, it will heal you for between 50 and 100 points of health, obviously allowing you to mend your wounds in battle. Now, physically, it is rather unique, with a strange animal-like motif, perhaps depicting the front of an eagle or a griffin. It's hard to tell, but it seems familiar and beastly, all carved into a strange material of dusk white with flirtatiously ephemeral hints of pink and indigo flickering across the ancient Bretonian shield. A fitting aesthetic for an artifact. We can learn more about Eliodon's ward from Yagrum Bagan's book on Tamrielic lore. Eliodon was a holy knight of legend in Breton history. He was a sought-after man for his courage and determination to set all wrongs right. In one story, it is said that he rescued a baron's daughter from sure death at the hands of an evil warlord. For his reward, the baron spent all of his riches to have an enchanted shield built for Eliodon. The shield granted Eliodon the opportunity to heal his wounds. And that is how the legendary artifact came to be. Which is pretty funny how it's actually a shield, because after I heard about its name, I spent all that time in hospitals looking for a Leodon's ward. Next, we have a total of four different unique items all found in the exact same place, which is a bit ridiculous, but that's why we're covering all four. So to get our hands on this hoarded bounty, we'll need to come to the island of Solstheim once again. Here, on the eastern side of the island, we have the Felsard Coast. Right about in the middle, we have the Thursk Mead Hall, just up the hill from the eastern shores of Lake Fjelding. It is exactly what you'd expect it to be, a mead hall kind of oddly placed in the middle of nowhere, making it a welcome path to stumble upon for any weary travelers. Now to find what we're here to find, we'll need to head around to the back of the Thursk Meat Hall, past the hut and smithery. And here we have all of our unique items, right here, just here, can't you see them? Right here inside this hollow tree stump. Now before we get to the items, I need to clarify that only one other hollow tree stump like this exists in the game and it is part of a quest, therefore it isn't all that secretive. Because of this, no one would think to walk around inspecting tree stumps for no reason. Well, most people anyway. So finding this stump and therefore the items within it is not a natural progression of exploration. You'd have to be very lucky to just happen to inspect and click on a one in a million tree stump. Anyway, inside it, we can find all the items in question and a bloodstained note that oddly reads, S, here is the equipment I told you about. Remember, the weak deserve no mercy. E. Well, that's cute, but no idea who wrote it and placed the items in here or who the note or items were meant for. But now 
they are ours. There are also five arrows here that aren't unique because there are five of them, but they are worth mentioning as their enchantment is to deal 5,000 points of damage. So they are a kind of one shot wonder arrow. But now onto the four unique items that we got from this stump. Firstly, let's take a look at Shadow Sting, a personal favorite of mine. This is an absolute beast of a weapon. Sadly, it has the generic skin of a standard ebony long blade, which of course still looks cool and all, but it's just not as unique as it could be. Now its damage output is quite high, with a maximum damage of 50 with a thrust, which leaves it with a maximum DPS of 67.5, which is fairly high, overtaking any Daedric base weapons and being almost double that of the standard Ebony Blade. Its enchantment is also strange and unique, dealing 5 points of poison damage every second for 20 seconds, which will deal 100 damage provided the full 20 second effect is allowed to complete. But the other part of the enchantment is an application of 200 to 100 points of chameleon for 20 seconds on the enemy. Now, firstly, the reason I'm laughing, I don't know why, but it says 200 to 100 rather than 100 to 200. So I do believe that's numerically incorrect. But applying points of chameleon to the enemy, what? So what this means is that when you hit the enemy, they, for the most part, become invisible, which is not handy for you at all although you'll be able to see them still because of the poison cloud around them. It's a very strange effect, but overall can deal some decent damage. And when combined with the oddly high damage of the weapon itself, it makes Shadow Sting a great choice for low level players given it's relatively easy to get. The second item found in this tree stump is the Ring of Raven Eye. I absolutely love this ring and usually end up wearing it for the entire game. It fortifies the marksman's skill by 20 points, but more importantly, it grants Night Eye for 20 points. These are both constant effects as well, which means you put the ring on and it stays that way forever until you take it off. It's like marriage. Now what Night Eye does is makes everything brighter, which in Morrowind is important as there are a lot of caves that are genuinely super dark and either require torches or magical effects and abilities to illuminate the darkened depths. Honestly, every playthrough, this ring goes on my finger and never comes off. And even if you don't want to wear it all the time because you want to use some other rings, having it in your inventory for those dungeons or situations where you do need to see a bit more, particularly in areas ruled by House Dagoth, the tribe unmourned, having the ring of Raven Eye handy is a welcome option to all players. And again, super easy to get. Now, the last two items are a pair of gloves treachery and deceit. Deceit is the left-handed glove that fortifies sneak by 20 points as a constant effect and treachery is a matching right-handed glove that fortifies security by 20 points as a constant effect. Now sadly they are both a clothing item and provide no protection from incoming damage as they boast no armor ratings so you'll need a high unarmored skill or just don't get hit. Now the skills they fortify are a little more niche when compared to the broad usability of the ring of Raven Eye that we just spoke about, but every now and then, I mean everyone needs to sneak, and even more so, everyone needs to open lock things in Morrowind. So the usefulness of having these gloves in your back pocket well outweighs the burden they will bring to your carry capacity. Next we have two items that we get at the exact same time, so we'll cover them together. In the hazy afternoon light of the West Gash, through thick brush and rugged countryside, just to the southeast of Nisus, across the shallow river Samsi, we'll stumble upon Barandis, one of the few ancient Dunmary strongholds. From a brighter time for the Dunmar, and my my, has Barandis become so dark. While it looks inviting enough, these ancient strongholds never are. As soon as we enter the top level of the keep, we'll be met by a foreshadowing of what's to come. The following hallways are filled with Dremora, ready and waiting for their next victims. These halls are littered with them, but like a trap in avoiding them, we wriggle our way down deeper and deeper. Down we go into the keep's lower levels. The danger become more varied and dangerous, ranging from Scamp to Golden Saint to Atronarchs of all elements. A dungeon of a conjurer's dream, but we're no conjurer and this is no dream. We will go deeper into the area simply known as 
the underground, is where we will enter a portal through the wall that's been knocked out. And it might as well be a portal to hell because we can find hungers, Daedroth, Dramora Lords, tortured and trapped souls like this skeleton pinned to the mighty grey stalactite by a Daedric spear and a Daedric dagger, hanging over a fire to be burned alive as the Dramora watches with lustful satisfaction at the abused bones. But we can go even deeper, you can always go deeper, into the final mega chamber. A huge room filled with sulfur and scorching fumes spewed from volcanic vents. In the middle stands two winged twilights, Thou, beasts of oblivion that will snatch men up, breed with them and toy with them until they perish, then feed on their flesh once they have been used for breeding. Between them lies a character simply known as Dead Hero. On his corpse we can find an artifact of all things, the Boots of the Apostle, a very powerful item that allows the wearer to levitate for a time. Again, like the Ring of Raven Eye or Shadow Sting, this is always an item that I come and get for myself, as it's a great item for any player to have. However, the Boots of the Apostle are not why we came here. So if not the Boots, then for what? Well, in a flash of deja vu, we'll need to look up to the dizzying ceiling of the Magma Chamber. Of course, we'll use our newly acquired Boots of the Apostle and their levitation enchantment to make our way up. Once we pass the huge slab of stone in the gullet, we'll see two rock shelves dotted with various mushrooms, bones, the feeding nests of the winged twilights. But there is also a lone Breton healer up here named Ama Nin, who turns out is actually an apparition of the divine Mara, and she doesn't exist at all. However, we don't know this right now, and when we speak to her, she will ask for a scroll of divine intervention so that she can teleport out of this hell pit. Now for us, the player to be carrying a scroll of divine intervention isn't actually that common. I personally use an amulet of divine intervention or you can get a spell to do the same thing. These are both much more reliable than carrying around a single use scroll. So most people wouldn't be carrying the scroll in the first place. Point being to come here and then get all the way down to the bottom, then for no reason, levitate to the ceiling of the cave and then to also happen to be carrying a scroll of divine intervention to give to Amanin is a very unlikely situation. Just for reference for this video specifically, it took me about 60 minutes of searching different vendors before I found one even selling a scroll of divine intervention, so again a very unlikely set of circumstances. But once we hand Amanin the scroll of divine intervention, poof gone. But Mara's skirt has been added to our inventory as well as Mara's blouse. I uh, wouldn't mind seeing Mara right about now. But these are the two unique items that we came here for. Hidden from just about every player and blessed upon us by Mara herself. Now Mara's blouse is incredibly powerful. It is one of only five unique shirts in Morrowind and it is the only shirt in the game to have a constant effect enchantment, which gives you a 10% resistance to all magic types. Again, again, very powerful, and this should definitely be sought after by all players. Mara's skirt, on the other hand, well, it is the only unique skirt in the game, and the only enchanted skirt in the game, and also that enchantment is a constant effect but it is far overshadowed by its matching blouse, as Mara's skirt only provides a constant effect of fortify health by five points. Look, everything counts, and there is no other skirt in the game to consider swapping this one with, so I will take the free five points of health. Thank you, Mara. Also worth mentioning that in Morrowind, you can wear a shirt, a belt, pants, and a skirt and a robe, and all at the same time, a full set of armor. So wearing Mara's shirt and Mara's skirt will detract from the other pieces you want to wear 0%. So of course, any player going for a meta build should get and wear both of these items at all times. Anyway, that is the long 
and the skirt of it. Next on the list, we have two items that are found the exact same way, so I've included them both. So for this first one, we'll need to go to Solstheim, of course, added with the Blood Moon DLC. We'll need to head to the western side of the island to the Mosring Mountains in the northern ice glades of Thoromora's Watch to the west of the Water Stone. Here we will find an ancient forest of wind-carved sentinels standing whitewashed and frozen next to the sea and an ice-covered river leading to the salt shores. At the fork in the water, we can see a few openings in the frigid crust formed onto the water's surface. If we dare plunge down into the icy depths, we will soon spot an object lying on the riverbed. This is the unique Reekling Lance named Frost Gore, a crudely wide short blade with the handle completely concealed with the skinned fur of an ice wolf's head. It's also shiny so we know it's enchanted. As you might imagine, it has been blessed with a magical ability to deal frost damage with each strike. More specifically, 10 to 30 points of frost damage per hit. Sadly, its maximum damage is 24 with a thrust, which when taking its speed into account, only allows it to deal a maximum base damage per second of 31.2 and then the maximum enchantment damage is 30 which is quite high but when we combine the two totals it can only deal a maximum total damage per second of 61.2 which might sound good but there's so many variables that it can often deal like a third of that damage so it's not really that good also the enchantment only has enough charge for five uses which is just embarrassing low five swings into a fight and you run out of enchantment so yeah Frost gore, more like frost a bore, cause it's boring. <laughs> but before you perish from that pun along with me, let's take a look at the other item found this exact same way, also on Solstheim. So in the northeastern section of the island, we have the Felsard Coast region, in which can be found the biggest lake on the island, Lake Fjelding. This lake is massive, which makes locating this item a real pain, especially with there being so many openings into the water. Even once you find it, you probably won't know it. For example, the item that we want is in this shot right now. Can you see it? Yeah, neither can I. Anyway, at the northern edge of the lake, against the shore is a shattered portal to the frigid waters below. If we jump in here and swim down to the stone floor, we'll see a long, straight object glowing magically. This is the item we came here looking for, Harkon's Lucky Break. A unique silver staff buried at the bottom of a lake almost impossibly difficult to spot. I came here looking for it for this video, I knew exactly where it was located, and it took me ages to find it. It's also worth noting that the name Hakon is spelled differently to the Hakon we know from the Dawnguard DLC from Skyrim. This staff, Hakon, is spelt with two A's and no R. However, in the base game of Morrowind, there is a Nord found in the Asha R.E. Eggmine named Hakon, spelled the exact same way as the staff, with two A's. Now this guy is not to be confused with another character in Morrowinds called Hakon, spelled with one A and no R. And that guy isn't to be confused with Hakon One Eye, who is another character also spelled with one A and no R. But the one character in Morrowind, Hakon, who is spelled with two A's and no R the exact same way as the staff, appears to have no relation to the staff, Harkon's lucky break. Although Harkon, the character, is a Nord, so he may have originally come from Solstheim, and this could very well be his staff. Now with that strangeness aside, Harkon's lucky break is your standard silver staff in appearance with its serpent-like motif of the head, and also matches with a standard variant of the weapon in stats, which I will save you the particulars of. Instead we'll boil it down to this thing stinks and you should never consider it seriously as a weapon of choice. Now the enchantment however is very strange and could be rather useful, but also rather not useful, as its effect is, when cast, it will fortify the wielder's luck attribute by between 1 and 50 points for 30 seconds. 
Now, luck in Morrowind dictates how lucky you are with every dice roll in the game, whether you block an incoming attack, whether you land an attack on an enemy, whether you unlock that chest, how good a loot you get, how much gold you get, all that stuff. Which, you know, in big enough quantities, luck can make a massive impact on your gameplay. But the sad irony is the range of effectiveness on this stuff from 1 to 50? I mean, again, it's irony. You have to be lucky to get a good effect from Harkon's lucky break, which will then make you more lucky for 30 seconds. It is, or at least it can be powerful, but it's kind of like, when exactly do I use this? Am I meant to use this before I open every lock pick? Do I do it before I loot every box? I mean, most situations in the game have luck play a part in one way or another, but do you really want to lug this thing around with you? so you can get between 1 and 50 luck boost for 30 seconds? Probably not. And you sure as hell don't want to carry this thing to be used for its, dare I say it, melee capabilities. So, it looks like Harkon's lucky break might have been losing this thing. Now, we must head south, so far south beyond the Vale of Fog and swim out into the inner sea, off the coast of the Ascadian Isle. The best place to do this? is the Imperial Port and Headquarters of Ebenhart, next to the city of Vivek. From here, we can see some small islands in the ocean, thanks to mods, but in the original game, you would have to swim aimlessly into the sea before they would peep through the haze of the 2002 draw distance. But at these distant shoals, if we peer beneath the lapping waterline, we will see a drowned wooden door, leading down into the cold stone sea belly. This is a place known as Mudan Grotto. We must enter it, where we will be plunged into a dark subterranean brine, with sea kelp tangling around us like Hermaeus Mora's embrace, as we force our way into tight, slippery holes and worm our way through the swollen tidal cavern. Some parts are even so tight, our character will get wedged between the ceiling and the floor. Twisting voids and fading shafts make navigating this salted hellhole all the more deadly. Not to mention we need air, or we will begin to die quickly and painfully. A dre awaits us in the penultimate hydro chasm, a worthy challenge for the seasoned adventurer. Beyond him, through a thicket of seagrass, we'll spot something foreign, something ancient, a sealed metal portal to a Dwemer citadel of a Vardenfellian clan, long forgotten. This is known as Mudan, the lost Dwemer checkpoint. Inside, we'll not be met with air, but more stale, salted seawater. Not even the tonal architecture of the Dwemerian fortress could keep it out. Well, I guess 3,500 years of abandonment will do that. There are a few pesky little slaughterfish to slay before we can finally breach the surface and breathe in some air. Although not fresh at all, stale and leaving a bitter metallic taste in our gullets. But air nonetheless. Just while we're here, in the Mudan right tower is where the Easter egg remains of Pikat Achu are lying, next to his note and of course the poison that killed him. You can check more out about that in my Easter egg video for Morrowind. But what we need to do for this video is head through another trapdoor into the Mudan central vault. It has a lock level of 100 and is also trapped. So we need to be a master of security to even attempt to open this thing. Inside, we can find a lone sentient, a dwarven steam guardian. Amongst other treasures and hoarded heirlooms, there is a steel Dwemer chest, which is also locked with a level of 100 and trapped. Now we can bypass this, however, by killing the Dwarven Steam Guardian, where on its remains, we can find the Dwemer Guardian Key, which we can use to unlock the archaic chest, where inside we'll find one item, one single item, and it's what we came here for, the legendary artifact, the Dragonbone Quirus one of my favorite items in the game. We can learn more about it from Yagram Bagan's book on Tamrielic lore. This Quirus is one of the greatest artifacts any collector or hero could own. It is constructed of real dragon bone and was enchanted by the first Imperial battle mage, Zurin Arctus, in the early years of the Third Era. 
It is a truly exquisite piece of work and many have sought to possess it. The properties of the Quirus allow the wearer to completely resist fire and to damage an enemy with a blast of fire. This isn't actually true, it's just in the book, and it's a lie. Little is known about the involvement of Zurin Arctis in the enchantment of the Quirus, but an old tale speaks of a debt that he owed to a traveling warrior. And like the warrior, the Dragonbone male never stays put for long. Two things wrong there, it's referenced as the Dragonbone male, even though it's not called that, it's called the Dragonbone Quirus, and it also does not have the ability to deal a blast of fire damage. However, it does grant the wearer a 100% resistance to fire damage, which as someone who plays as a Nord, who have the racial passives of 100% resistance to frost magic and a 50% resistance to shock magic, wearing this chest piece and having the 100% resistance to fire magic as well, I mean, that's just unbeatable. It also has the highest armor rating of any item in the game, along with the Lord's Mail and Eliodon's Ward with a base rating of 100 and a maximum rating of 333. Aesthetically, it has a completely unique skin, along with all artifacts in the game, with a fittingly bone color and texture. And I do believe it is the only item in the game made from dragon bone. I know there are some dragon scale pieces, but no other dragon bone pieces. So the best armor rating in the game, complete immunity to all fire damage, and you get to uh, slide yourself inside a dragon like Donkey and Shrek. Now we actually have two different items. One leads to the other, so we'll have to have a look at both, I guess. Now to get our hands on these pieces, we'll need to come to the southwesternmost isle of the Zafirbel Bay in the mid-east of Vardenfell, a region unwelcoming to most and ruled by the exalted Hells Talvani, mainly comprised of highly egocentric and ambitious mages. Now, while he isn't the Arch Magister or even a council member, one of their elite is a man named Devaith Fear. We'll need to visit him at his mushroom tower, known as Tel Fear. Here, along with Devaith Fear and his four daughter wife sisters that are actually female clones of himself that he made, Alfie Fear, Biet Fear, Delti Fear, and Upsi Fear, lives Yagram Bagan, the last living Dwemer and master crafter to the chief tonal architect, Lord Kagrenak. But that's not why we're here, it's just an interesting tidbit for you all. So, after entering Tel Fear, we need to make our way through the fungi padded vestibules and exit the Onyx Hall into the Tower of Fear. Now, like all Telvanni Towers, to actually get anywhere important, we'll need to have mastered the arcane arts enough to teleport up through the central column and into the upper levels. Up here, we can find the man himself, Devaith Fear, possibly the oldest living mortal in Tamriel. He's so old, he was once Kaima before Azira's curse turned them all into Dunma save for Aeum, the mother of Mercy Almalexia. But back to Devathir, a powerful and ancient wizard harboring many treasures and daughters. But we are here for one in particular that will lead us to the other item. So on one of his bookshelves, on the bottom shelf, there is a small ornate lockbox that is trapped and has a lock level of 100, the hardest in the game. Now, given Devate Fear is arguably one of the most powerful mortals in existence, and the fact he is standing right next to us means that few players dare attempt to open this ornate lockbox, in fear of the fear, if you catch my drift. Devate Fear is also required to complete the main quests, so angering him by stealing his stuff, we'll probably end up in a fight with him, we'll have to kill him, and this would be a terrible turn of events because we would have to load a save file so that he's alive again so that we can actually finish the main quest. Therefore, no one ever opens this damn box. But what most players don't know is that he doesn't care if you take his stuff. So you can unlock this small ornate lock box provided you are the required master lock picker, and Devate Fear won't kick off. So once we do slip our hand inside the little box, we will find, hmm, a uh, seemingly ugh, uninteresting item, the, the Daedric Sanctuary Amulet. We'll need to take a brief look at it, I guess, as it has a healthy value of 3,100 gold, although it's nothing special for Morrowind, and it has no enchantment either. Seems meaningless, I guess, but it's kind of cool, but 
this item is just a means to an end. It's a key to a door. It's the ionized particle trace to a portal. So prepare yourself and once you have equipped the Daedric Sanctuary Amulet, we will be teleported, torn from Mundus to a Daedric Shrine existing in an unknown location called Magus Volar, where we will face off against Lord Dragus Volar. A battle of the fates will ensue. He is quite tough and should be dealt with quickly. Once he is killed, be sure to loot his remains, and as soon as we do, pah, magic. We will be teleported back to the safety of Telfir Tower. With this message, you have defeated Lord Dragus Volar. The Daedric amulet that brought you to this place disappears from your inventory, but is replaced by Volar's own weapon. You now wield the Crescent Blade. Even though it's called the Daedric Crescent. Anyway, we can learn more about the Daedric Crescent from Yagrum Bagan's book on Tamrielic lore. Probably the most rare and even outlawed item of all the great prizes is the Daedric Crescent Blade. The blade was used by Mehrun Dagon's Daedric forces in the capture of the Imperial Battlespire. These extremely unique blades were gathered up and destroyed after the Battlespire was recaptured by the Empire. All but one, it seems. Though the Empire believes them all to be destroyed, it is rumoured that one still remains in existence, somewhere in Tamriel, though none have ever seen it. The blade lends its wielder the ability to do great damage on an enemy and allows him to paralyse and put heavy wear on his enemy's armour. Quite the prize for any mighty warrior, if it does indeed exist. So while the Daedric Crescent has been talked up quite a lot there, and to be fair, it is a powerful item. Its maximum damage is with a slash cap of 50 and a maximum damage per second of 62.5, which again is really good, but when compared to other artifact blades, it might just fall short a bit. It still lands in, you know, about the top 10 melee weapons in the game, but there are others, especially in the expansions, that have far more powerful effects and damages. Now it's enchantment, Paralyzed for 10 seconds? This is absolutely brutal for obvious reasons, of course. Being able to paralyze an enemy for 10 seconds basically lets you have your way with them, and they can do nothing about it. Just like the Australian tax office and my money. Now, the other half of the enchantment is great for killing enemies, but not great for looting enemies. It disintegrates their armor 5 to 30 points on touch. So smashing your paralyzed enemy and destroying their armor rapidly while doing so with each thrust it digs deeper and deeper into their flesh as their armor fades to dust. Again, great for killing, but if you plan on looting them and selling their armor, well you might find yourself with a massive repair bill before you can sell that stuff. So I think it's a great weapon against enemies you need to kill, but for your average Swit or Enwa, I'd be using something else. Now aesthetically, it is 100% unique. No other weapon in the game is shaped even close to this, with devilish motifs and a uniquely silver blade for a weapon of Daedric material. It also appears to be the same weapon as the crescent blade depicted on the cover art for the Elder Scrolls Legend Battlespire. And as we learnt about the Daedric Crescent from Yagrum Bagan's book on Tamrielic lore, the Battlespire is exactly where these crescents came from. And this is likely the last one in existence. But besides all that, it is a must-have for collectors, and even if you don't want it, it would make a great gift. You can give it away as like a, a birthday crescent or something. Now this next one, between you and me, isn't that hidden. I mean it is, but not compared to some of the other items on this list. But it is acquired by so few players due to a silly little bug. So, we'll need to head out into the absolute middle of nowhere, the charred pyroclastic spirelands of the Molag Amur region. Set solid into the side of an ashen hill, we can find the Marin ancestral tomb. We must enter it. Inside, we will be greeted by all manner of foul undead, from common skeleton to bone lord. But in the final chamber, we will find a strange man standing at the ancestral altar, a Nord barbarian named Crazy Batoo. 
he wears a full set of bone mold armor with a pair of the rarer Armun and bone mold pauldrons, save for of course his helmet, which we'll get into a second. But living up to his name, he will attack the player on sight. He's not a particularly challenging enemy, but when we kill him, we get the famous now meme message, only displayed when you kill an essential character such as Vivek or Devaith Fear. With this character's death, the thread of prophecy is severed. Restore a saved game to restore the weave of fate, or persist in the doomed world that you have created, you big dumb drongo. So of course we get this message, we go, oh damn, this guy must have been important and imperative to the main quest line, I'll reload a save file so I can finish the game, therefore not killing him or getting his loot. Now the thing is, at no point in the game do we ever get sent here, at no point is this character mentioned, this location and crazy Batou are connected to no quests in the game, but what happened was it just turns out that crazy Batou has been incorrectly labelled as an essential character. So when he is killed, players revert to a previous save, expecting him to come into the fold later on in the game. So while he is easily killed and easily looted, so few players actually end up with the loot which is what we came here for, the Blood Worm Helm, an artifact that is mentioned in Yagram Bagan's book on Tamrielic lore. The King of Worms was said to have left behind one of his prized possessions, the Blood Worm Helm. The helm is a construct of magically formed bones. The helm allows the user to summon skeletons and control undead. It would be a prized artifact to the necromancer, which I expose explains how this Nord Barbarian ended up in a tomb in charge of a bunch of undead. He didn't use his magic capabilities, he used the magic capabilities of the helmet. So the Bloodworm Helmet is an evil and cursed trollbone helmet created by the King of Worms, better known by his actual name, Madame Marco. Sadly, this helmet is pretty bad, especially for heavy armor. It's got an armor rating of 18 and a max armor rating of 60, blah, which is like 20% the protection of the top tier heavy armor helmets. Yeah, you can literally get things five times better. Now its enchantment, however, could come in handy. Cast when used, turn undead 20 to 30 points in a 20 foot radius for 30 seconds. And also it summons a skeletal minion for 30 seconds to fight for you, of course. Now for me personally, these are all effects where it gets too fiddly for too little return. I'm very much with the thought, just get a big sword and smash the undead, instead of carrying around a crusty old trollbone helmet so you can make them run away for 30 seconds. Although, it is an artifact of Manamako, the King of Worms, so it should be able to worm its way into any collector's vault. And finally, we have the most ridiculous item acquisition in Elder Scrolls history. So first, we'll need to come to the sleepy seaside town of Hla Ode, tucked away in the southern mires of the Bitter Coast on the western side of Vardenfell. Just to the northwest of here is the Daedric Shrine, known as Ashurn Ibibi. I'm not kidding, that's what it's called. From here, we need to swim west out into the Inner Sea. Seems to be a fruitless effort at first, but soon we'll spot a massive structure beneath the water. As we dive down, it would seem we have discovered the Elder Scrolls equivalent of Atlantis, an ancient city lost to the sea and ages. But amidst the brine and a mecha tomb ruins is a shattered shrine to Boethia. If we speak to the head, we will be given a quest to find a mason or sculptor to rebuild a new shrine for Boethia. So now we must head back to land in search of such a craftsman or craftswoman. But where to go with no direction or help? We must just simply find one. Well, luckily I'm here to guide you, so we'll need to head to the bustling imperial mining town of Caldera, slotted quietly into the back hills of the bitter coast flirting with the ashlands. Once here we'll need to head to Gorak Manor, a large house famous for the various orcs that live within it, and of course the talking scamp merchant, Creeper, who we later discover in the Elder Scrolls IV Oblivion to actually be Clavicus Vile's servant and companion Barbus. But upstairs in the highest room we can find an orc named Duma Grolag, and this is the man we are after, a master sculptor, who is currently working on a piece called Untitled Rock. 
from here, we will tell him that we wish for him to recreate the Shrine of Boethia. He will accept, however, he will also require 2,000 gold and a unique book he simply calls Statue Book. Okay, so now we need to hunt down a statue book. Again, with no hint of where to find it, but we must find it. Okay, so from here we need to go to the Mages Guild in Caldera, then upstairs to Amelia Duronia, the Guild's teleportation mistress. We need to tell her that we want to go to the Mages Guild in Vivek City, and that will teleport us there. Once here, we'll already be in the canton we require, the foreign quarter, so all we need to do is head down to the Waste Works, where we can find Jobush's rare books. A place for all things book related. Naturally, here there are many books, and the Khajiit rare book salesman himself, Joe Basha. From him, we'll want to buy the unique book called Boethia's Glory. This contains the appropriate schematics and sketches for Duma Grolag to rebuild the statue. So once we buy it, we'll need to head back upstairs of the Vivek City Foreign Quarter Canton to the Vivek City Mages Guild and speak to Flacasia for Seas, the guild's teleportation mistress. We need to tell her we're traveling to the Caldera Mages Guild and once back in Caldera, we'll need to go back to the Gorak Manor and then back upstairs to Duma Grolag. Now, we'll need to give him 2,000 gold and the book we just bought, Boethia's Glory. Then he tells us he's going to rebuild at a place called Kartag Point on the Bitter Coast. We will now also have it marked on our map as a new point of interest. Now sculpting a statue from a giant rock of course takes time, so we'll need to wait for 21 in-game days to pass. Fastest way to do this is of course resting, sleeping or waiting. Once that is done, we'll want to head to Kartag Point. Fastest way to do this from Caldera, just walk over a few hills, through a few swamps, and we're there. And sure enough, now we have a giant statue of Boethia here. If we speak to Duma Grolag, he'll just tell us that it's done. Thanks, Duma. I wasn't sure. But if we speak to the new statue or shrine to Boethia, we will be rewarded by Boethia with the legendary artifact Gold Brand, a really powerful sword that makes appearance through Tamrielic lore and is quite the weapon to wield. However, that's just the start of obtaining what we're here to get. So now that we have Gold Brand, let's get these other ridiculous wheels in motion. The next stage is to become a vampire. Now this might sound cool, but being a vampire in Morrowind was really, really bad. It made your character super overpowered, but you could not go outside during the day or you would take deadly sun damage and every NPC in the game won't talk to you, save a few. So it makes finishing any quests or faction storylines impossible. So we'll have to find one of three lairs belonging to one of the three vampire clans, the Shadows of the Burn, the Mages of Onde, or the Warriors of Quara. Once inside one of these lairs, we'll need to try and become infected, which is harder than it sounds. Now we can become infected by participating in melee combat with a vampire or by looting a vampire's corpse. Now I spent about 40 minutes standing around, breaking armories worth of armor, trying to stay alive while being battered, bashed and bitten by a gang of blood sucking parasites, or what I like to call a good Friday night. Now during this time, at some point I became infected despite me not getting a message that I became infected. Now you can tell that your character is infected by going to your active effects tab, where there should be a restore fatigue symbol and under that there will be a restore fatigue one point due to porphoric hemophilia. This is the early stages of vampirism. Now to fully become a vampire we must sleep for three in-game days, after which time we'll be woken by this. I dreamt of a blonde maiden. I drew near and saw she was crying, but her tears were red as blood. I touched her tears and tasted them, and they were wonderfully salty, sharp with spice and savour. But the maiden's face had changed, her skin grey white, and red tears dripped from her lips, and her hair turned black and wreathed around her head like twining snakes. I was afraid, but I could not run. I screamed and then I woke, heart pounding cramped and aching. Now this is our dream dealt certificate for fully transforming into a vampire. 
Now, what we'll need to do is head to the Vivek Mages Guild. Annoyingly, thanks to vampirism, no one will talk to us, including all of the transport masters and mistresses. So, we'll need to run there. At nighttime, of course, because at daytime we will die. So across the map we go, walking, running, jogging, whatever we're doing, until we eventually get to Vivek City's foreign quarter. Once here, we need to go to the very top, to the major Guild, the very same one we were in earlier. In here, upstairs, there is an ultimate night blade named Sirilonwi, who, despite us being a vampire, will still talk to us. Though she finds us abhorrent, she does have a task for us to have a man named Sheshevsky killed. Allegedly, he can be found inside the Aldskar Inn in Aldrun. We will, of course, accept this reasonable request and need to make our way to Aldrun. Now, for those of you who aren't geographers of Vardenfell, Aldrun isn't close to Vivek City. And because we're a vampire, we'll have to make our own way there. At night, of course, or we'll be burnt alive. This will take some time, but at least the scenery is nice. Eventually, over hill and through forest, we'll be in the Ashlands and at the gates of Aldrun. Once here, we'll need to head to the Aldskar Inn, where we'll need to hunt down Shishev. Shishev can be found downstairs and he's easy to spot because he's in a bright purple robe. Luckily, as soon as we talk to him, he will become hostile towards us because we are a vampire, which is very much not a good thing in the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowinds. Once he's dead, we need to loot his corpse and take his key, the one that Cyrilon we wanted, Shishev's key. Now, we'll need to head back to Vivek City. On foot, of course. At nighttime, of course, because no transport master or mistress will offer their goods to us because we are a foul beast, a vampire. This will take, again, some time. But hey, at least Morrowind is pretty. Eventually, and four pairs of shoes later, we will reach Vivek City's foreign quarter canton once again. And yep, you guess it, straight back up to the Mages Guild and back to Cyrilonwi, but, but, save the game before talking to her. Before talking to Cyril Onwi, we must do a few things. I repeat, we must save the game so we have a backup file in case something goes wrong. We must be carrying Shishev's key, just as she asked. We must be carrying Goldbrand, the sword we got from Boethia. And we must be carrying exactly to the septum, 11,171 gold. Exactly. Once all of those checks have been met, then we can speak to Cyril Unwe and click on the topic of someone killed. And there it is. Your journal has been updated. Shishev's key has been removed from your inventory. Goldbrand has been removed from your inventory. Elton Brand has been added to your inventory. Go to hell, Carolina. What? <laughs> All right. And that, my friends, is how we acquire Elton Brand. Needless to say, this is by far the most hidden and almost impossible to acquire item in any of the Elder Scrolls games. I would not be surprised if this item was discovered by someone going through the game's scripting and coding rather than it being discovered by someone actually playing the game, if that's even happened ever. So before we get to the item itself and its uses in game, it does need some explaining quite clearly. So, Elton Brand, otherwise known as Blue Brand, is an easter egg that was implemented by Mark Nelson, one of Morrowind's developers. This is the same guy responsible for the Blue Dev's ring of viewing from earlier on in the video. So Mark Nelson's nickname is Blue Dev, which stems from the Duke Blue Devils, his favorite basketball team. Blue Dev is also the object ID for Elton Brand. And of course, Mark Nelson is a developer, otherwise known as a dev. Blue Dev. Okay, so one of the players on this team, the Duke Blue Devils, was a man named Elton Brand, which is of course the name of the sword. Now the longtime coach of the Blue Devils is Mike Shashevsky, and for this quest we had to kill Shashev and get his key. We had to get Shashevsky. Now the Blue Devils were bitter rivals with the North Carolina Tar Heels. That's why we get the message, go to hell, Carolina. Also, the Duke Blue Devil's best victory at this time against the North Carolina Tar Heels was 111 to 71. 11171. 
the exact number of gold we needed in our inventory for the script to activate to replace gold brand with Elton brand. Equally as relevant is the fact that Mark Nelson's date of birth is November the 1st, 1971. 11, 1, 7, 1. Again, the exact amount of gold required for this scripting to work and for us to get our hands on Elton Brand. So there you have the full backstory and explanation for why Elton Brand even exists in the game. So now that's out of the way, let's take a look at the actual weapon in game. It has a maximum base damage of 60 with a chop and a maximum base damage per second of 90, which overpowers that of Goldbrand, which was a maximum damage per second of 75. Now this does make Goldbrand one of the most powerful weapons in the game, matched with the mace of Avar Stonesinger, only outweighed by Al Malexia's Hopefire and the profane tool Sunder. However, its enchantment changes this. The enchantment is fire damage 10 to 30 points on touch, fortify attack 30 points for 30 seconds on self, and restore fatigue 10 points on self. So once this is added into the maximum base DPS, Elton Brand surpasses both the Mace of Avar Stonesinger and the Profane Tool Sunder by over 20 points of damage per second, and is only 4.5 points of maximum base DPS shy of Al Malexia's very own Hope's Fire. But its enchantment charge is 500 and only consumes 5 per strike, leaving it with one of the largest enchantment pulls of any item in the game. Funnily, Tarasa Aram, the Dunman Noble and curator of the Museum of Artifacts in Morrowind's capital city, Mournhold, does not recognize Elton Brand as an artifact and will not buy it from the player, perhaps rendering the weapon non-canon. So Elton Brand. I would come up with a joke normally, but I honestly think this whole weapon is a big enough joke by itself. Actually, I do have a joke, but you're not carrying the right amount of gold. Sorry, better reload a save file and try again. You ain't getting your hands on Camel Brand, baby. And there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. I've been Camel, and I do hope you have enjoyed the video and learned something new about the Elder Scrolls 3 Morrowind and all the crazy things that can be found within it. Let me know which other items you think should have made it to this list of most hidden unique items in the game. If you've watched up until now, you'll be very interested in checking out the other Elder Scrolls videos that I've already done, links to them can be found down in the description. Now down there in the old description you can find all of my social media links, be sure to follow me on Twitter and Instagram, and if you'd like to support the channel in a more of a personal way, Patreon and YouTube sponsorships are available, as I'm sure you know all of my time and energy goes into making these videos that I create for you to enjoy, so your support is most appreciated and welcomed in any and all forms. So thank you very much for watching, thank you for supporting the channel, and I will see you very shortly in the next video. I'll see you there soon.